Thank you for coming this afternoon. My name is Leslie Williamson. I'm the executive director at the Salton Stahl Foundation for the Arts and the Salton Stahl Arts Colony. I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, I just have a few little public service announcements. This would be a good time to silence your cell phone. I know you all have one, just make sure the <laughs> ringer is off. You can take pictures, you can tweet us at Buffalo Street Books. Monica and Javier are also on Twitter, just want to let you know. Um, I am also a brand spanking new member of the Buffalo Street Books Board of Directors. So new, in fact, that I have yet to attend my first board meeting, which will be tomorrow. Uh, as you probably know, if you're a member of the Ithaca community, I want you to know that the single best thing you can do, buy books. When you're buying Javier's book, look around, get it signed, think about your sort of pre-Christmas shopping list, it's not too early, take a lap around, buy some books buy some cards or a calendar. I always buy my calendar here at Buffalo Street Books, so that's my plug for the bookstore. The Salt and Stahl Foundation for the Arts is Ithaca's own little arts colony. We are dedicated to supporting New York State artists and writers, and we do that primarily through competitive, juried, all expenses paid fellowships, mm -hmm. of which Monica and Javier have both attended. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, you get a free month of time and space in which to work on your craft. We eliminated the application fee last year, which is kind of amazing for a residency program. We're now one of the only ones in the country that eliminated that fee for you to apply, and it's entirely free to attend. And also wanted to acknowledge that Salt and Stall's programs are made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislator. We're now receiving general operating support from NISCA. I'm very proud of that, so I want to acknowledge their support for all of our public programming. I promised, well, I didn't really promise. I almost promised. I promised Monica and Javier that I would keep it short because I know that, you know, less is more. But I also believe that uh, accessibility is a real issue, and for those who do not have access to the internet, who are maybe watching this on the public access cable channel and are just kind of stumbled over this and don't know who our guests are, I am going to read their <coughs> bios. I know you can also find them online, and they're on the website, but I'm going to read them to you here, so hopefully you'll enjoy that. I'm going to introduce Monica first, and then I will come back up and introduce Javier. And I want to thank you guys for being here also. You made a lot of, you traveled a long way to be with us tonight, so thank you. Monica Sook is currently the 2016-2018 Stadler Fellow at Bucknell University. She is a Cambodian poet from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she is the author of Year Zero, which won the Chap Book Competition from the Poetry Society of America. Her poems appear in Narrative, Kenyan Review, The New Republic, and the Virginia Quarterly Review, among others. Please give a warm welcome for Monica Sook. Hello, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so honored to be back, and um, I was just telling Leslie how how wonderful it is to really be back because um, Salt and Stall is like um, such a safe space for me, such a great home for me to continue doing my work. I actually hit the ground running, and I started to do more work because I have deadlines, and it really got me, you know, to finish my work. So. It's such a great space, definitely check it out. Um, so tonight I will read some new poems um, from my full length collection, A Nail the Evening Hangs On. Okay, so um, I'll read an excerpt of this poem. The Book of Spung. My story begins in water, dark as the ink I store deep inside my brain the blackest ink with which I wrote myself out of the darkness. But why, you ask, always someone must ask, does my ink dry and not cloud? Because my tentacles, when I was born, ripped open the soft walls my mother made with the dream of leaves blowing in a storm. I crawled out of my egg and took my first breath, each tentacle with its own thoughts, very much like rain, each moved freely as they wished, and one kept reaching for the shore until all joined in. Land, like roots, they scale the temple roof all the way down, digging into ancient, broken tiles. 
I have always wanted to be a tree. Now I am old. I am a tree. Branches full of leaves I hold up to block the sun. Who would have thought an octopus like me could provide the sweetest umbrage by way of camouflage? Should I say this again in cephalopod so you might understand? Written inside a sucker, the only word I know, my name, spung. Do not blame my dead mother whom I ate. You cannot fathom the terrors I've seen in order to be this close to the sky. This close. I was this close to the sky. Sreymol, you cannot fathom all I could see. Terrible, terrible from that treetop. Lugye, the weaver said to me once, her mouth chewing, or at least I imagined it. I yawned and rubbed my eyes at the clock. She'd spit into a plastic lined jar she kept under her bed, next to the wooden back scratcher that I used as my cane or my wand, and maybe when the lights went out, she'd whisper, Spung, it's a shame, meaning me. I didn't understand her. Distinct feelings, unnameable and numerous, gathered on her wrinkled forehead. Her hair, short, gleamed silver. Night she did not have the words, I wonder if she used to kneel in the backyard, rubbing her head against the earth, if her strands connected to the grass, if my mother ran outside to uproot her, or if she did the same, and wait, well I do this too. It's a shame that I was born in this country long after the war, where all wars are from. Lugye passing through as though in a hallway, one hand pressed to the wall, struggling. I live in some other world too traveling separately alongside hers. And when she died, no one could carry on her weaving or tell me how to thread the loom with one strand of my hair. She threaded the loom with one strand of her long silver hair, which might have kept growing until she was done, which might have fallen out, but I would come in and sit beside her on the cushion without her noticing, and she would continue. Every day I saw this old woman weaving at her loom rivers and lakes underneath her hair, the bottom full of silt. I could see it if I reached with a comb, and that was when she'd look at me. Under her hair, she kept her oldest son, who was out for a morning swim, with swallows swooping down to touch the water. If I reached too far or dipped into that lake, she'd halt the circling shuttle, slammed whole rows of weft into warp, and sometimes I witnessed this old woman weep, the first time I couldn't bear that lake, the second time I swam there on purpose to learn she was real. I shed my octopus tears too. We were safe. She let me ask her what made her happy as she worked on silk dresses, what made her hair never run out. When she was tired, she tied her hair and let all the tired animals around her house drink from her head. Drinking from her head one last time. My family crowded Lugye, her arms stretched out to us. I floated to her side, slouched in the hospital bed. In my hands, her wrinkled veins bulged, our eyes locked in the cafeteria. With my cousin, we stared out the wide window. I sighed, not because Lugye was dying. I was becoming a poet, uncertain of myself, stupidly unaware. Now I look for her in pictures where my toddler brother chews a banana, and I'm days old cupped in her lap as she meditates over me, praying for me. What? Spung, it's me, the old woman at the base whose back unbreakable gave life to the whole chain. Here is the baby whose cry you must catch when I disappear. And like that, she transferred a power to me, not that of a weaver, but a wordsmith, ink in my brain always hunting at night for her words untranslatable. I have what women in my family possess, a leaking heart, mine in bed when I return to school, my mother's on the phone, the news no one wanted me to know. I couldn't keep it a secret. That afternoon, I learned my mother, through all her silence, was a truth teller. I thanked her and hung up with the strange feeling of mosquitoes. One day, they will come for my mother too, and she will not look back. Wow, that was the first time I read that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That was like an excerpt, and I thank you because it was all so long. So thanks for going there with me. It's uh, another world I'm trying to build. Um, let's see. So I 
I'm Cambodian American. I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and my parents were refugees from the Khmer Rouge regime, um, which happened in 1975 until 1979, and there was still like you know lots of aftermath after that, um, up until the 90s. But my my family came um, and resettled in Harrisburg, and then I ended up in Lancaster. Um, and there's so much I'm learning, you know. And when I was at Salton Still, I really process all of these things, especially um, by looking at um, history books um, and just seeing such a lack of um, understanding of the Cambodian narrative and such erasures as well. It was certainly in a very American perspective. Um, so I think it's always wise for us to take a step back and look at the, the ones who are very much affected, the immigrants, the refugees the children of diaspora even, um, who inherit so much trauma. Um, I think I'll read some more from my new book, um, which, which is a manuscript, <laughs> so not a book yet. But um, I think I'll go ahead and, and read some others. Um, um, so growing up in Lancaster, my, my dad would always read to me. Um, and he would read to me by, like in our dining room. Um, on the floor. So this is a story about that. A, B, C, for refugees. Cherub D, how does a man who doesn't read English well know that Cherub Dum, those aren't really words, B, D, but birds. Cherub Dum, he stumbles, reading to me by the sliding glass door, Cherub D, through which I watch my brother play in the dum dum yard. Cherubi dee, Cherubi dumb, like how my father says, fine then, leave, my mother shouts, stupid, dumb. We live in a small BD nest too, one hallway, two be dumb slam doors. Birds? What are birds? Thanks to my father reading with me, I have more feathers. T-H-E, first word he ever taught me to pluck. It is a word used all the time. Cherub, cherub, beat em. the mail, the mailbox, the school bus, the, the. He asked me to read the mail, not birds, mail. If you don't read this, you will turn into birds. And I read it to him the best I can. The end. A feather, two feathers, the, the end. Mother, mother, repeat after me. Cherubi dee, cherubi dum. We read together before bedtime. I think I'll read two more poems, and thank you. Thank you so much for being here, holding space. Um, the woman who was small, not because the world expanded. The elephants came out from the fields, each passing me by their trunks to the back of the parade, heading toward Chambak, towards a village doused in fires that in the pond fish had fried and looking at that dead water was a woman I had seen running home each evening with a bucket in her hand. Always her speed was the hair that flew in my face, always her feet sounding of tanks which made dogs bark and flee, footprints deep as trenches in the grass. This is the woman who had shrunk so small when the planes came, nobody could ever find her. And since more planes, her size stayed small as a spoon, and the world seemed to enlarge, though nothing had changed. And when she saw me, she hid, threw pebbles at my ankles and another, until I bowed down and easily picked her up, folding her inside a banana leaf. She slept. She slept well. She who is my mother, sleeping out the world again, whose person I hold in my hand when she wants to be held. And um, I'll read this last poem, which I wrote in Cambodia in November, around this time last year, I believe. I think it must have been this time last year, like this day. I went to Angkor National Museum in Siem Reap, and um, there was an exhibit, and that's the name, the name of the title is the exhibit. In a room of 1,000 Buddhas, the water in my heart was falling. To my right, a row of Buddhas in meditation, sheltered by the Naga snake. But this snake was real, unlike the official snake in America, 
who appointed several other snakes to his cabinet. The Naga protected the Buddha from rain, spread its seven hoods to keep him dry. And did I tell you it was raining all day? I bought a poncho to ride around Simriyup, rain during the dry season, Buddha calling on the earth for witness, something water protectors at Standing Rock are doing right now, protecting water because water is life. But a night of rubber bullets and tear gas and water hoses, that is not life. Today, too, while eating breakfast noodles in my hotel, neo-Nazis saluted the orange-skinned snake. They were not calling on the earth, their palms up but facing down. Looking at the Buddha, I thought, he looks like me. Some with broader shoulders, some from pre-Angkorian and Angkorian times, some from this century, four sitting back to back in a circle, each in different mudras, sandstone, wood, stone, depending on what was available or how kings chose to perpetuate who they worshipped. Sitting on the coils of the Naga, eyes closed or looking down. Some look scared, calm. Some with hands missing or cracked down the side. Some look starved, their clothes shattered. One, wooden, was defaced, standing, except for a small lip of curve of lip and one shut left eye. There were others, smaller, smallest people. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Before you ask, the reason why you can't buy Monica's book is that it's completely sold out. <laughs> Year Zero was a competition, and it was a limited run of 500 copies, and um, they're gone. Except for some of you are lucky enough to have purchased one, I know. I can see it in the back. Mm -hmm. So you will just have to wait until this brand new manuscript actually becomes a book in the world, and then hopefully uh, we will bring her back and there'll be another book. So Javier's book release party was September 5th of this year, and I just want to recite his itinerary so that you grasp the full implication of the, the frequent flyer miles that have gone on since then. San Francisco, Manhattan, Brooklyn Book Festival, Danville, Kentucky, San Francisco, Tucson, Los Angeles, Humboldt, Manhattan, Portland, Oregon, Ithaca. And in three days he goes back to California for another four events in the next couple of weeks. So um, when we had planned this, well anyway, it's a long story. We didn't know there was going to be so much back and forth and we did not coincide with that Manhattan trip. So Javier has been back and forth across the country once since Manhattan. Anyway, I'm very grateful that both of you are here in particular. I hope you do get the frequent flyer miles and <laughs> buy something really nice. <laughs> Javier Zamora was born in El Salvador in 1990. His father fled the country when he was a year old and his mother when he was about to turn five. Both parents' migrations were caused by the U.S.-funded Salvadoran Civil War, which was from 1980 to 1992. At the age of nine, Javier migrated through Mexico and eventually the Sonoran Desert. Before a coyote abandoned his group in Oaxaca, Javier managed to make it to Arizona with the aid of other migrants. His first full-length collection, unaccompanied by Copper Canyon Press, published this past September, explores how immigration and the Civil War have impacted his family. He's currently the 2016-2018 Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and is the 2016 Ruth Lilly Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellow. In 2016, Barnes & Noble granted him the Writers for Writers Award for his work in the Undocu Poets campaign, and he recently won the 2017 Narrative Prize. He currently lives in San Rafael, California. Please give a warm welcome to Javier Zamora. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you all for coming today. And thank you, Benjamin, for being here, and thank you, Monica, for reading with me. Um, this is the first time we read together since the book came out, right? Yeah. And then we'll read together again on Friday, which is kind of dope. It's cool. Um, I'll start with this. So I guess you need to know that, so the book came out September 5th. Trump repealed DACA on September 5th. And, um, and so I haven't returned to my country 
since I came here in, in 1999, and I haven't seen my grandma. And the book is dedicated to her, and this is a poem for her. To Abuelita Nelly. This is my 14th time pressing roses in fake passports. For each year, I haven't climbed Marañón trees. I'm sorry I've lied about where I was born. Today, this country chose its first black president. Maybe he changes things. I've told mom I don't want to have to choose to get married. You understand. Abuelita, I can't go back and return. There's no path to papers. I've got nothing left but dreams where I am the parakeet nest on the floor de fuego, the paper boats we made when streets flooded, or toys I buried by the foxtail ferns. Do you know the ferns I mean? The ones we planted the first birthday without my parents. I'll never be a citizen. I'll never scrub clothes with pumice stones over the big cement tub under the almond trees. Last time you called, you said, my old friends think that now I'm from some town between this bay and our estero, and that I'm a coconut, brown on the outside, white inside. Abuelita, please forgive me, but tell them they don't know shit. <laughs> so I'll try to read poems that I haven't read so I don't get bored with the book. And I haven't read this one, we'll see. So. Um, dad left in 1991, I was one, and then mom left in 1994 when I turned four. So then I grew up with my grandparents, and my parents kept promising that they were going to bring me, they were going to send for me soon, soon, and that never happened until I turned nine. But for a kid, you know, years are super long, so this is a meditation on that. It's called the Bod. I'll be back soon, mijo. But in our windows, still no glass. Where raindrops hit the sill, they touched my skin like her eyes did that morning, she said. I'll be back soon, mijo. After the rains, too many mosquitoes. So the clinic sent uniformed men who sprayed a thick fog meant to kill larvae. We covered bowls, pans, pots, and bottles, washed them by hand. But Abuelita still accidentally broke my milk bottle, so I would stop asking for mom. No glass in our windows. I know she won't return. I've memorized the names of roads I can't pronounce, far from these volcanoes that know what toys I don't let friends touch and in which drawer I keep the letters mom has sent me. I touch the larvae growing in old tires in our backyard. I know. She won't return. Abuelita hid my letters with addresses I can't pronounce, so I would stop asking her to read them to me every night under this terracotta roof, under this candlelight. And I was a weird kid. I, I didn't stop drinking milk from a milk bottle until I was like six. I don't know what that's about. I haven't read it anymore. So that's true. Um, let's see what else have I read. Well, we go to the war. Look at this. Okay. So I got a review, which I hated, because they thought that the, my grandpa, they called him a gangster. My grandpa was not a gangster. I think they've been watching too many do narcos. Because in the book, I called him Don Chepe. But in Latino culture, Don is just a sign of respect. So I hate, I hate whoever wrote that. <laughs> Clearly, they didn't understand the book. But um, yeah, this is a poem about Don Chepe. So he's not a gangster, he was in the military. Don Chepe. The war is or isn't over, but coffee still brews. Sugar keeps vanishing. He's burned his uniform and never wears boots. His daughters break mirrors on him to save their mother when he returns waking neighbors, waking his grandson. His hammock is wet, so are his pants, the parakeet a wind-up clock, his daughters in nightgowns, his grandson in their arms, his 
Black boots don't make towns flee anymore. Don has always been the wrong word. Redacted addresses, 38s, clips in back pockets. To see how many he'll kill, his grandson throws rocks at tadpoles. One by one, his daughters leave. Don has always been what his wife didn't know how to wash from uniforms. His grandson is asked to fetch vodka when Don tries to forget the still opened eyes. Not even that wakes them. No one can cover mirrors in time. No one can find the scorpion in their shoes. And from there I go this one. They're related. I'm a huge fan of tequila and gin, but during dark times it gets me to a bad spot. So this is, I think, not a lot of people acknowledge what an immigration story or having after going, going through like crossing the border, what that does to the psyche and depression is a big part of that. And this is just a reminiscence of that. It's called Nocturne. That was funny, you started with a bod, now Nocturne. Day, night, um, Nocturne. Tomorrow won't be the same. Each step farther from the border, gin and tonics, tequila grapefruits. I threw that black mug at your face after gin, after tequila. I'm sorry, I drank too much. I drank too much, I know. It wasn't me who threw it, I said, but it was. I was four. I saw mom between grandpa's gun and grandma. I was four. He chased every single one of his daughters with his machete in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night. I didn't know what to do except climb the water tower across the street with Red Power Ranger. He's chased us to this country that trained him to stay quiet when his boss put prisoners in black bags, then pushed them from the truck for everyone to see what happens to bad people here. Gin, straight up, tequila shots. No one understands why Abuelita never left him. It's mid-June, Venus and Mars, the closest they've been in 2,000 years, but I have never seen grandparents hug or hold hands. I make an excuse. You kept rubbing your hands. When I turned six, Grandpa quit drinking. He stayed at home at night, but never talked to us. He didn't like gin, <coughs> didn't like writers, didn't like leftists. Everyone gone except one cousin. You're not here. Tomorrow, tampoco. These walls snore like Grandpa's lured shouts. I thought the border would take him. All my aunts, my mom, thought so too. We are all running from the sun on his machete, the moon on his gun. And more depressing poems. Um, let's see. Well, this one's not that depressing. Um, so that last po that last poem, I started at Saltonstall. So thank you. Yeah, it was like this poem that I didn't know how to start or end, and it appeared in Poetry Magazine too, and then I edited that version because I didn't like it, and then it was this. So, yeah, thank you, Salt and Stone. And this one I also wrote at Salt and Stone, and I haven't read it. So. I watched um, an old Russian film at Salt and Stone, where there's the steps of Odessa, any film buffs here? So it's like the first montage ever shot. And it's like this beautiful, like black and white Russian and like people are running down the steps. That was copied in The Untouchables. So it's like this whole idea of like going down the steps. So I copied that form on the page. So the stances look like steps. And the title is Montage with Mangoes, Volcano, and Flooded Streets. 
I helped Abuelita pluck the white flor de sote from stems to put in the bowl, to then drop in the pan, to mix with eggs. There's no way mom, younger than I am now, and in California like I am now, there's no way she knew my technique. Grab stalk and pull toward belly, bowl between legs, petals like rice from open burlap. I'm older than dad then. For the longest time, I wanted to, to throw rocks at fruit bats, wanted to run out of the kitchen to climb the big mango tree, branch by branch, up six meters, to watch the volcano's peak fit in my hand. Lie to me. Say I can't go back. Say I've created smoke and no rain. It's almost 20 years and still I can't keep mangoes from falling six meters down to where dogs lick what my aunts, mom, dad, and I still cannot. And, and let's go to the border. So then after growing up, I came here when I was nine. The trip was supposed to take two two weeks. It ended up taking two months because the coyote left us in southern Mexico. And then me and seven others, which then eventually turned into like 50 others at the border, we tried um, three, three times to make it across the Sonoran Desert. It's a desert and one of the times we ran out of water. And there's, if you're familiar with the Southwest, there's this huge cactus, Sawados, and they have a lot of water inside of them. So this is based on one of those instances. Sawados. It was dusk for kilometers and bats in the lavender sky. Like spiders, when a fly is caught, began to appear. And there, not the promised land, but barbed wire and barbed wire with nothing growing under it. I tried to fly that dusk after a bat said, la sangre del saguaro no seduce. Sometimes I wake and my throat is dry. So I drive to botanical gardens to search for red fruits at the top of saguaros, the ones at dusk I threw rocks at for the sake of hunger. But I never find them here. These bats speak English only. Sometimes in my car, that Viscous red syrup clings to my throat and I have to pull over. I also scraped needles first, then carved those tall torsos for water, then spotlights drove me and 30 others dashing into Palo Verdes. Green striped trucks surrounded us and our empty bottles rattled. When the trucks left, a cold cell swallowed us. Thank you all for listening. It's an honor to be back here. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, I'll end with this poem that I end every reading with. I always start my readings with the same poem and end it with the same poem. I don't know what I'm reading between, but this is a poem I wrote during another dark time uh, when I thought that the only time that I was going to go back to El Salvador was in a coffin, which is the reality for a lot of immigrants here. So please remember to call your representatives and tell them that we're humans too and that we deserve a path to citizenship because there is none. A lot of people think, oh, why don't they just go get a job and then apply for citizenship? No, it's not that easy. So call your representatives. And in this poem, uh, you have to know that Estero de Jaltepec is the bay where I come from. Como Tu is a poem by Roque Dalton that influenced me a lot. And there's a lot of Spanish at the end and those are just flowers. So thank you for listening. Instructions for my funeral. Don't burn me in no steel furnace. Burn me in Abuelita's garden. Wrap me in blue, white, and blue. A la mierda patriotismo. <coughs> Douse me in the cheapest gin. Whatever you do, don't judge my home. Cut my bones with a machete till I'm fine as dust. Wrap my pito in panties so I dream of pisar. Please, no priests, no flowers, no crosses. Steal a flask and stash me inside. Blast 
music, dress to impress, please be drunk, miss work, y pisen otra vez. Bust out the drums, the army strums. Bust out the guitars, guerrilleros strummed. And listen to the war inside, please. No America mierdas. Caruse the procession, dancing to the pier. Moor me in a motorboat. De veras que se una lancha. Driven by a nine-year-old son of a fisherman. Scud to the center of the Cerro de Jaltepec. Read como tú and toss pieces of bread. As the motorboat circles, open the flask. So I'm breathed like a jacaranda, like a flor de mayo, like an alcatraz. Then forget me and let me drift. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for supporting writers by your presence here. Thank you for supporting the bookstore. And hopefully we'll see you next year, as far as Salt and Stall is concerned, for more readings. Get your book published, come back. <laughs> Thank you again. Have a lovely evening.